So I think we can get started. So thanks to everybody who's joining me today. We're going to be doing the first color pass on this Rembrandt monochrome painting. And the palette that I've selected to use for this purpose is my trusty Zorn palette, which is a combination of pigments which I really, really appreciate. Now, this color palette is composed of four pigments. It has some kind of white. My white of choice is flake white, but you can use titanium white. It has ivory black. It has yellow ochre. And it has cadmium red light or vermilion. Now, this palette is very useful for painting human figures because, as you noticed, it's mostly, since it has black and white, every gray imaginable in terms of the value scale, and it has the potential to make yellows and to make reds mixed with some variety of gray. So that means that we can make saturated reds, we can make saturated yellows, or as we painters call it, chromatic, but we're not really able to do stuff like explicitly saturated green, explicitly saturated blue or purple, but as you probably know by now, people aren't usually purple or blue. So the majority of the colors that we find in the human figure are variations of yellowish grays, reddish grays, and orangish grays. Now orange is gonna be pretty easy to mix because it's just gonna be a cross mix between the yellow and the red. And this is exactly where I'm going to start. Right now from this very modest palette, I'm gonna take a few minutes to create some cross mixes that are gonna be excellent shortcuts for me to use as I'm painting. So the first cross mix that I'm gonna find very useful is some kind of orange between the yellow and the red. So my trusty old palette knife, drag in my other hand. There we go. Always have a rag when you're mixing color this way. It helps you keep your mixtures clean, your palette knife clean, and everything in order. So just making a very simple cross mix of the cadmium red light and my yellow ochre to arrive at some kind of orange that is going to be super useful for me as a shortcut. Now, after having done that, what I now have is three colors of somewhat higher chroma. Of course, the red is more chromatic than the yellow, and that's because on the human figure, the areas that are most chromatic, like lips, you know, cheeks, they're usually chromatic in the red areas, not in the yellow areas. Like we don't have areas that are super lemony yellow, right? So we need a more chromatic red than yellow, and that's why now we have a situation where this is the most chromatic, this is the second most chromatic, and this is the third most chromatic from the colors. Of course, everything goes on that goes on here is zero chroma. Now, what I'm going to want to do next is make three more cross mixes between the black and these colors. So it's going to look something like this. We're going to take some yellow, ochre, and put it here. We're going to take some of this orange and put it down here. And we're going to take some of this black, for black, some of this red and put it down here. And each one of those colors is going to get some black treatment. The first is this. We have a nice low chroma dark red. Very useful. We're going to add that to the palette, right there. Second, we're going to want what's going to be a kind of brown, black plus orange. Going to get a, this is coming out a little too green to, for my taste, so I'm going to mix it into the remaining red real estate over here just to make it a little bit less green. There we go. I want a neutral, neutral brown. So that's working really beautifully. And the last one is really going to come out looking pretty green. You're going to notice when I mix the black into the yellow, that's really going to give us like an olive green. And this already starting this way 
is encouraging to me because I don't feel like I'm working with a very limited number of pigment. I made these cross mixes and now look at what's going on. I mean, when I, yes? Um, they are asking if you can please remind how to get an expanded view of the pipe. Oh, she found it. Okay. Oh, okay, so. Maybe if you want to look at it. Yes, yes, yes. So what's going on here? Right, that's an excellent question and thank you for bringing it up. So the highlight video is currently spotlighted. So if you change your view from gallery view to speaker view, you will see the palette enlarged. And then you can kind of um, use your cursor to expand that screen. You can't do it in gallery mode, but in speaker mode, you just grab the bottom left of the palette video and just pull it to the left until it's as large as you can make it. And hopefully that solves this problem. Thank you for bringing it up. Uh, so where was I? Yes, so from a very small number of pigments, I have kind of expanded my palette, but without adding any new pigments to it. So now I have, I have a brown, I have a dark red, I have a green. So I have a lot more stuff that I can work with now, which uh, is making me pretty happy. And now would be a good time to start mixing colors for the painting itself. Ken, could you please um, type the name of, um, can you tell me the name of the colors he is using? Yes, so the, the names of the colors are, actually since, since I'm not typing, but Daniela is, I am going to make sure that I post these later on Patreon. So don't be too worried about having to take uh, frantic notes because this video in its entirety is going to be uploaded to Patreon. So you can rewind it, redo it. I'm gonna write in the caption, everything that's on my palette is gonna be super clear. So about those things, just, just don't even worry about it. And if something is still not clear in that respect, uh, I'm gonna just feel free to message me on Patreon and I'll, I'll send you all the supply lists that are imaginable because as soon as we start geeking out about materials, you're never gonna hear the end of it from me. But from now, I'm not going to spell the pigments to Daniela because it's going to take a lot of time. So here we go. What do I want to start with? I want to start with mixing some skin tones. Uh, and for that purpose, you know, the orange is going to come pretty useful and also some kinds of browns. So let's just kind of play around with it and see what colors we get and what colors we still need. I usually start when I'm, when I'm confronted by something as overwhelming as Rembrandt. I want to start on my palette and just kind of play around and see the kinds of colors I'm getting, feel it out and see, okay, this is going to be useful here, not going to be so useful here. And once I mix a color, I kind of hover over my painting and see, well, that's a very nice skin tone. This could be pretty useful. Okay, I can see this works here, but if I try to put it here, it's going to be way too light. All right, so this is going to cover up some areas of the forehead. That's going to be nice, but I need something darker for the chin. So no problem. So I take this nice color that I mixed, I set it to the side. Let's move the medium and the solvent out of the way for a moment. I need some real estate. Set it to the side, grab a bit of it, and make a darker variation by adding more of this brown to it. So that's going to come in pretty useful. Nice little gray. Now from that, you know, I take this color and I say, okay, yeah, it's a nice dark gray. It's pretty useful in many areas, but I might need a version of it that's a little more saturated. So for that purpose, I'm going to, again, take this color that I mixed and say, well, maybe let's add a little bit of red to it. Maybe a little bit of white. Just kind of playing around it, capturing some colors that are going to be helpful. And this is great because you can really spend a very, you know, substantial amount of time on the palette. Familiarizing yourself with the pigments, it really helps you kind of gain access into the painting without starting to make moves that are gonna cause a mess, right? Because as soon as we're already painting, everything can very quickly spin into chaos, which doesn't really make us happy. But if you spend a few moments on the palette, just in advance, getting yourself prepared, then you're gonna be set up for success because it's like right now I'm, I'm collecting my artillery. 
right? I want some kind of lightish kind of, well, this is a little too green, so we're gonna add some orange to it. Just making sure that I have some stuff to play with once I get this going. That's a beautiful light green, gonna come in handy. And this is a pretty good time for questions while I'm playing around on the palette. Are there any? Uh, no, yet. Not yet, okay, great. So everybody's following along. That's very good. So making this a little bit darker. And it's very important when you're making these colors that you spend some time on your middle value. Like this, of course, it looks light, but it can go much lighter than that. You don't want to use up your artillery too quickly. So always when I'm starting these mixtures, unless I'm going to be mixing this like highlight, I'm adding a little bit of some color from these three, which means it contains some degree of black in them. So I'm already like in, in advance, I'm, I'm preparing my color not to be too light um, because I want the ability to lay things out in these colors that are not too light and then say, oh, but my highlight needs to be lighter. So I'm reserving some value uh, range for me to use later. So these look like fine, fine midtones to me. I'm pretty satisfied with where they are. I just would like to get something that's a little bit more chromatic for the, for the cheeks and definitely for the lips. These won't, these won't be chromatic enough. So for that, I might need to go for some more red in here. And as I knew that this brown was gonna come in very handy, soon I'm gonna to need to mix a new batch of it. It's pretty predictable. This is gonna be a very nice chromatic red, which is gonna come in handy. Let's make a slightly lighter variation of it. It's gonna be very useful for things like the cheeks. Notice it's still coming in a little pale which is nice. It's not, it's not as explosive as it would have been if I started the mixture without adding any black to it. Black is really great at reducing chroma and making sure nothing, you know, spins out of control at the beginning. This is enough to start, so I have a lot to play with here. And eventually, of course, I'm going to have to also mix some darks. Maybe I'll mix one general dark color. Uh, let's see what I can do here. I'd like a lighter version of this. So it's just going to need to be a little bit more yellow and red. I'm hearing some audio. So that failed. I put way too much black. Set this aside. Try again. More yellow. More red. Yes, much better. That's what I was going for. A little bit more yellow. Make another version of it. This is going to be the reddish version. This is going to be the yellowish version. Just two kinds of light, lighter versions of these colors are going to come in pretty handy. All right, I think I can start now. I think I have a bit to work with and of course I'm gonna be mixing along the way but at least I have some colors I know that if I use these colors nothing is gonna go too crazy because they already kind of look nice together on the palette if colors sit on the palette and they look like they're playing nice together then even if I like splatter this on my painting in an abstract way it's still gonna be pretty harmonious because it's harmonious on the palette so it's a very good practice to have to make things on the palette in a way that already works on an abstract level so that when you put them on the painting, you know, things are, things are looking up. So let's prepare to start painting these. And let me know if some questions came up while I was doing all of that. I'll leave yours here. Thank you. All right, so let me just pick, pick a brush from these options over here. This looks like a fine option. And how about I start with that forehead that's calling out to me. It's nice to start 
with uh, a light area. Can I have a book, please? Sure. Oh, there's one for you. Uh, you don't do color study to try too much colors beforehand? Uh, I can, but I did not. But it is a very good idea to do that because if you're inexperienced with color, that's really going to be a great environment for you to test what you're doing before you're putting a study that you worked on very hard at risk. The reason I'm not doing it is because I'm pretty familiar with this palette and I have pretty high confidence that I'm going to make it work with these colors because I know them very well. But making color studies in advance is certainly a good strategy to follow. So as you're noticing, I'm playing with these colors that I've made in advance and I'm mixing into them some of these, again, colors that are more like the palette colors. So these are just baselines and you can always grab from the top and make yourself some extra variations. For example, here when it starts to meet the, the hat, it's going a little bit greenish and a little bit darker. So just making this update over here. I'm going to have a rag in my hand for this purpose. And as I was working on this forehead, what's obviously calling out to me, and I'm sure you can notice, is the fact that I didn't mix anything that's suitable for the highlights, so I'm kind of just surrounding it in an awkward way. So that's not really going to fly. We're going to have to do something about that. So we're going to do something about it right now. Uh, as I look at the highlight, it's looking like a pinkish color. And for that one, I'm not going to be too keen on using black. So I'm just going to use a little bit of ochre and red to make a color that makes no sense. This is not going to be useful here. This maybe will work for the nose. Put it aside. This needs to still be less explicitly pink. It's leaning pink, but it's not explicitly pink, so put some more yellow in it. That's much more like it. Put some of the pink back. Gorgeous. That is much more appropriate. Let's set that aside. Now we're going to try to use it and see if it looks good. Yep, that looks quite well. Looks like it's working. It's a good color. And around it, we have these moments that do strike me as more pinkish, more chromatic. So we're going to mix another variation of it, just a little bit more red, so that we can drop in value, but raise, raise the chroma as we're coming off this highlight. Take this color, mix a little bit into that more restrained kind of brown that we made. And use that color to come off the highlight. Even this is going to come in pretty useful over here. But yeah, I'm going to go back to what you were saying about those color studies. They're definitely a very good idea. If you can spare the, the time to make a color study and you're new to color, it's going to be very rewarding. All right, so now it's really starting to light up, which is good news. And we're going to move to the left side of the face briefly just to finish this turn. I'm seeing a little bit more reddish here. Rembrandt is so like slick with how he uses colors. It's just like things just blend into each other almost seamlessly. It's like the grays and the oranges and the duh and the duh. And if you start to try to, to capture all of them in your first pass, it's uh, it might be overwhelming. So try to squint at your reference a little bit just so that you can see the broad color decisions 
instead of immediately shooting for all the different variations and all the different details. Try, if you can, to keep it simple. Like, for example, here, there's a really beautiful moment that almost looks blue. I don't know if you can zoom in and, and look at this area. Now, I'm going to try to mix something that looks blue. Notice that you're going to like it. So titanium, not titanium, uh, flake white plus ivory black gives us perfect gray. But notice how next to the other colors, it almost looks like a light blue. Do you see that? That's because by negation, everything here is like the families of yellows, oranges, and reds. So any color that's neutral is not going to look neutral. It's going to look cold because that's how context works in painting. And so I can use this color to pretend that I have blue on my palette when I don't. All right. Now, let me grab some of those browns here, bring them over, they're going to be useful. And this is a good time for questions because I'm figuring this out. Is everybody following along so perfectly? That's, that's wondrous. Nobody has a million questions. What are you doing there? That's crazy. Mm, I've never blah, blah, blah. Nothing? Not yet. Wow, <laughs> you guys are great. And have you had the chance to check out that Zorn palette lesson that I did that starts with a color theory expose? To anybody who hasn't watched that, that is going to be really, really useful. So I really recommend taking at least the first like 12 minutes of it or something. They are very, very informative. Uh, so I, I really recommend watching that. It's gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna see. It's gonna be, <laughs> it's gonna be worth your time. And if I haven't said that yet, it's worth saying. A huge thank you to all of you who've decided to support me on Patreon. It's very fun for me to do these broadcasts for people who have, you know, taken the time and taken the money to actually support me in the stuff that I'm trying to do. So I really hope that me doing this is fun for you and that you're enjoying it and know that I really, really appreciate what you're doing. So thank you so much. building out this forehead. Seeing how this is working? Very, very nice. We didn't need to mix so many colors, you know? How much do I have here? Like nine colors, 10, I don't know. Not a lot, not many. But it really helps because with, the, with these nine colors, by cross-mixing between them with the brush, I can create so many secondary colors. And it's much better than just coming at this study with nothing pre-mixed, you know? At least now I know that I have stuff to play with. Ilya said that um, she did it a scale of the yellow and the red as a start for the color study mm -hmm. of the lesson. Beautiful. And Jonathan said that he didn't watch the first video with the white underpainted. Mm -hmm. And he asked if do you always do this in portraits or if um, the, that's the method that Rembrandt That's a great question. So I don't always do anything. So I keep on changing my process depending on what I want my painting to look like. And Rembrandt definitely used methods that are very similar to this. In this particular case, a, a white underpainting made a lot of sense because what I had before I did the white underpainting is a pretty solid charcoal drawing, which is rare in my case because I usually just, you know, start out with nothing and figure it out. But since I had this, this charcoal drawing that was working really well, I felt like doing a dark underpainting was going to be pretty redundant because it's just gonna, going to express all the stuff that I've already expressed in that drawing that I made. So I felt like actually doing a white underpainting to complement uh, 
what I was doing with the drawing would be far more beneficial and effective. But also, yeah, Rembrandt did these kinds of things. Like he would do a general dark underpainting and then boom, come in with the white, start building up the textures. It's a, it's a great like, it's a great opening move for a, for a painting. I ask if you paint on top of the charcoal. I am, yeah. The charcoal is in the darks uh, and the paint is in the lights. And I have fixed it on my charcoal so that it doesn't go anywhere. All right. So slowly making this thing work. It's really behaving nicely. It's so fun to have these grays to be able to just desaturate these areas when they become too chromatic and after this dries ah oh, it's gonna be such a delight to glaze over it you're gonna love that i'm gonna love that everybody's gonna love that rembrandt's gonna love that we're gonna write letters home about how fun it is to glaze something that is working well it's always nice to like make if you're if you're working with your under layers like that and something is coming off a little too gray making it saturated later is so easy and i mean you can even see this right now right we started with a completely perfect gray and in almost no effort we're really bringing the color to life quite fast so don't be too like impatient with your oil paintings if it's if it's not like perfect in color but it, it has some other qualities going for it just let it dry and have like the understanding that you're just going to adjust it later once it's dry. You're going to have the opportunity to get back to it and to improve all those things. It's no big deal. Madeleine is asking if do you wipe out your brush between colors? Yeah, yeah. I'm holding this this here and I'm constantly doing that. So and yes. Do you use any solvent or oil to clean the brush between colors? I use solvent to clean the brush if it's too, if it has a lot of paint on it and I really need to. I haven't done it so far in my painting, I think, in this, in this painting so far because I'm not picking up uh, huge amounts of paint. Uh, using oil for this purpose would be a pretty terrible mistake. So don't, don't use oil for cleaning. That's not what oil is made for. I don't even use oil as a medium. I mean, the medium you see here on my palette is not, is not an oily medium. It's a Galkid uh, and, and a resin medium called Galkid. The reason I don't like using oil is because it dries so, so slow and just exhausts me as I need to wait for things to stop being sticky. So I stopped using oil like years ago and I much prefer using resin instead. Kate is asking, if the fixident makes the charcoal not change the colors you put on top of it. Yes, that's exactly what it does. The charcoal just stays in place and doesn't interrupt my painting process. So you can really see, I mean, I have a charcoal drawing right here. This eye is painted in charcoal. And when I cover it with paint, it's going to completely do nothing to my paint. Just going to behave and submit itself to the color whims of, of, of the rest of the process. You just kind of have to put a lot of fix it in. And it has some disadvantages because your painting becomes very, very, very sealed, which isn't always super fun. Uh, but for the purposes of this, since I worked on this drawing for like over a day, I wanted to really preserve it because I really wanted to make sure that you know, I don't come into this with a drawing that's sloppy. That would have been kind of embarrassing. And you guys would have laughed at me and I would have, you know, been sad. So I spared us this fun party. Madri Martri is asking, what else do you use other than charcoal for underpainting? So usually when I do the underpainting, I just use one pigment, either raw umber or burnt umber, and I use solvent. And sometimes I uh, use, use white in order to um, expand my value range. 
but a traditional underpainting, all you need is some solvent and a dark brown. So raw umber, burnt umber, Van Dyke brown, all these pigments will do perfectly fine. And there's actually another video that's already on my Patreon of a full hour and a half lesson of how I start a sergeant painting. It starts with the charcoal drawing and moves into the underpainting until the underpainting is fully done. So you can watch that hour and a half where I ex explain this much better because I have the actual paper in front of me and I'm able to actually paint it. Right now, since this is not what's in front of me, I'm not able to show you, but I really recommend going and, and watching that video because uh, I think it explains it pretty well. So coming into the nose, you know, I'm, I'm getting some of those colors which I have anticipated I would need with a little bit more chroma. So of course the nose is where it's, things start to get a little bit red in a beautifully graceful way. And I am, the reason that I'm working on the lights more than I'm, when I haven't started working on the shadows yet is because the shadows are where I have my charcoal drawing and it's covered with burnt umber. And surprisingly enough, which is, this is, this is very surprising, in my estimation, those areas actually look closer in color with just a burnt umber wash over a charcoal drawing, still look closer in color to the original than these grays look, you know? So for now, if I'm asking, okay, which, which area of the painting worked the least well, these areas that are just the charcoal drawing uh, with a burnt umber wash is actually pretty satisfactory. So I feel the need to get rid of the gray before I get rid of this brown. Some rulers falling off the wall, that's okay. Some rulers hitting the moderator's head, that's less okay. And thank you, Daniela, for helping us with this. I'm sorry for the news is standing. No, <laughs> it's perfect. Just taking my time to build the structure of the nose having a lot of fun with it because all my colors are really ready. Like there hasn't really been a time except for that highlight where I said, okay, like I, I don't have what I need. I need to really make something different. Everything I'm doing you're noticing is, is kind of from that initial color mixing that we've done in the beginning here. I'm dipping into some medium whenever I need to make some longer strokes, some more translucent strokes. I casually dip into that. There we go, get that classically reddish note that Rembrandt is so famous for. And then when it goes up towards the ridge of the nose, it goes more gray, more yellow. That's because, as you know, the bottom of the nose is cartilage. The top of the nose is bone. And bone usually leans gray or yellow while areas that have more blood, like cartilage or like muscle or fat, these areas lean more red. So here, you can see me making a mistake, putting way too much medium, that's not gonna be good. Don't want to overdo it with the medium. Once paint starts looking like this, like it's pooling and not really giving you good coverage, then, you know, lay off on the medium. That's, that's way too much medium. You just want the medium to extend your strokes to a point where they're the right length. And I'm gonna turn off this messaging thing. What's going on here? One second, pardon the interruption. There we go, close. And I'm thinking about all these little things, you know, there's a lot of details going on there. I'm just trying to think what do I need from them in order to start rendering three dimensional form. You know, this thing is kind of folding and this thing is falling and then here we have a bone. That's the kind of stuff that I'm interested in. Everything that's more superficial, I try to ignore if I can.
So in this area right here, we have some highlights that are a little bit less yellow than I painted them. So let's see what we can do about that. And I mix this yellow with this pink and a little bit of black, just a bit, to make something more neutral like that. I think that will come in handy. See that? It's like a nice light gray. Let's just have it as an option. See what it does. Because if I take this yellow and then I mix it into the gray, I'm going to neutralize that yellow just a bit. Let's see if that looks a little bit better. I suspect it will. Yeah, that's that's much more like it. I really didn't need that area to go all yellow on me, but it, it really isn't. Okay. Very nice. Now let's get at this redness of the cheek over here. See if this add a little bit more chroma. That's fun. That's a fun color. And then on top here, let's use this pink over here too. It's going to be useful. And here, this highlight goes a little green. Do you see that? How beautiful is this green over here? We're going to deal with it soon. But first, let's close up this, this hole. Uh, we have a purplish highlight over here, which is quite beautiful. For that, we're going to mix that pink with the gray. That's going to deliver something that feels purple. And then here we have something orangey followed by something yellowy. And we do have those abilities. So pump this up with a bit more orange. Finish up the top with some yellow. Something more yellowy. This bone is called the, well, no, it's not really that. It's the temple bone. How about questions? Anything coming up? Yes. Everybody's really attentive. I appreciate your time. Thank you for joining me. Having fun yet? <laughs> How's it looking from your end? Anybody making popcorn? Here we have a shadow that's kind of more chromatic, you see, so I'm putting some red in here. A little fun. Might we say, of course, enjoying my coffee. Perfect. Nothing like coffee with Rembrandt. Let me ask if there's a um, is there a way to zoom in closer on the face area of the painting? Where we, where's one there? there really isn't, unfortunately, because if I put this phone any closer, I'm going to have no room to put my hand. So you can definitely see it closer, but I'm not going to be able to paint. So we have to work with the technology as it exists. But it's a good suggestion. At the end of the lesson, I'm going to zoom in to show everybody what I've done. Just remind me to do that. Because that, as soon as I'm not painting, that is a great idea. Ellen is saying that she's having fun watching and listening. Thank you very much for joining. I'm having fun too. It's getting a bit of this bone structure in here. I need to bring that highlight back. There we go. And you're noticing that pretty strategically, 
I'm putting off the structures that are complicated, like the eye and stuff like that. That's going to really, you know, lead me down trouble lane because I'm going to have a painting that's really staring back at me. And I'm sure you all know that as soon as you start working on something like the eye, you are working on something like the eye for the duration of the session and you never stop. So I put these things off as much as humanly possible, really, because I want to make sure that this thing works as a face before I start putting stuff onto that face. I want the bigger structures to be in place. Now look how beautiful this green, yellowish green, and then this real perfect, like, neutral gray. I just love that. Let's see what we can do. This looks like a nice yellowish gray. How's that gonna play? Needs to be lighter. Yeah, still needs to be lighter. There we go. That is great. Still using, by the way, the same brush. This is something that's very nice about the Zorn palette since all these pigments, you know, there's just four pigments in here. No matter how much I try to make muddiness on my brush, I'm just not gonna really succeed because it's all a combination of the same four pigments, just repeating itself in different um, quantities. Very fun. Now let's go for this neutral gray. Beautiful neutral gray. Bit of medium, not too much. Can go more gray than that. Add some of this pseudo blue. Yeah, that works nicely. Let me see what's going on here with the drawing. So it's going down here and then here, and then it kind of stops. And it has a greenness tendency on the bottom. There we go. Now let's go back to the red. So as you notice, every Every spot is kind of hurting the spot that was placed before it because I don't want to paint timidly and keep on worrying about preserving the spots as they were initially painted. I go over the line and then I bring the next one again over the previous one because that's how these, these spots look like they're action packed. You know, they're pushing each other around. Nothing is just kind of falling asleep on us. Hope that made sense. If every spot is, is vigorously just, you know, stationary, just staying where it was initially put and nothing is pushing up against it, you're very quickly going to end up with something pretty boring. Mm -hmm. Building out these structures, it's a lot of fun. It's like once you have a good underpainting, it just is such a fun experience to start painting on it with color because everything's already built. You just got to come in here and do your thing, basically. Grabbing some of that darker brown. For the bottom of the face, we're starting to see some more distinct shadows. This is a little too dark, but granted, I'm gonna mix it into other colors. So it's okay if it's a little too dark just for a second, as long as I'm aware of it. And again, thank you so much for joining me. This is awesome to be able to do this with you. And thank you so much for your support on Patreon. I really appreciate it. It means a lot to me.
And if any questions come up, is a great time. Of course. Thank you. And thanks to Daniela, who's helping me with this, because I couldn't be reading your questions while I'm painting, so. Thank you. Yeah. All right, this bottom of the face requires some attention, as you're noticing, I'm not quick to finish it up because I don't want to make it sloppy. And this is not correct, it needs to be more green. Kind of struggling with the fact that I mixed kind of like mid-tone values and it's getting a little darker down there. So the prudent thing to do would be to pause and mix a set of darker colors, but I'm trying to get away with it for time's sake, just mixing it with the brush. And sometimes that's a little sloppy. So here's a lesson for us. That kind of works. Nice. Just get that, see if I can light up that chroma just a tad, because with all the pushing, whenever you push paint around, chroma gets reduced. So I'm just gonna bring that pink back from oblivion just a little bit. Man, Rembrandt didn't make it easy, huh? There we go, much better. Get this green on his back. It's beautiful green over here. Don't want to give it up. All right. Now, what's going on over here? Let me zoom in on my reference one moment. Okay. So, yes, again, it's leaning yellow, but it's lighter than this. So, I'm going to cross mix this. that yellow in there and then when it gets darker it has a little bit more reddish quality to it and that's happening here right as it connects to the nose and here on the bottom Now, what's calling out to me now are these areas that are looking when because they're still gray from the underpainting, they almost appear blue. You can't really have that happen. So now I'm cleaning my brush with solvent because I'm going to be using a significantly different color. I'm just going to give them a light wash just so that they can relax. Not be so blue. Blue is distracting me. Not going to deal with them yet. Just going to mask them with some brown because the blue is pretty violent color wise. Now it's easier to see. You'll see in a few minutes, 
it's going to relax because right now it's looking a little wet because it has solvent in it. But once it settles into place, it's going to be easier to see because these blues were, you know, once you have some noise like that in your field of vision, things can get confusing. Let's try to get to that bottom area of the face. So the trick over here is that it's not, not as light as we think. Definitely not as light as we think. And the middle of it is leaning kind of grayer than what I'm having. So let's mix a little bit more gray into that. And in the edges, it's starting to have a little bit of a red flushiness to it. So we're gonna make sure we're not missing out on that. So that would be the gray. And then around that, let's grab some red. Okay. Now the gray is a little bit getting overwhelmed. So we're gonna put a little punch over here. This gray punch right there. Just like that. And right underneath the lip, we have this red moment right there, just like so. That's really starting to look a lot closer to what we're going for. Wash my brush again, because I want to do another kind of wash. So you wash for the wash. Grab this dark red and give a little bit of a wash on the lips before I get into them. I just want to put some foundation on there very, very lightly. Barely any color. That was actually too much. I'm going to wipe some off. This surface is very non absorbent, so everything I put on just immediately stays on. And above the lips, we have a moment that's more chromatic than anything I mixed really, so I'm gonna try to hit that too by mixing it with a brush. This one here. Everybody's so quiet. Yeah. Nothing to ask? Nope. People asleep? This is this boring? Is, I think this audience will just um, watch it. All right. As long as everybody's following along, that's great. I'm having fun. <laughs> you are? Thank you. Just hope nobody's getting bored at home. It's exciting to roll with Rembrandt. Exciting and scary to roll with Rembrandt, but worth it. We learned so much in the process. Soon I'm gonna to get to the ear. The ear is driving me crazy, being so gray. And then I can get back into the lips and the eyes. It's gonna be great. Okay. 
Okay. Now, before I get to the ear, just going to soften up some of these edges over here to make sure that I give them a moment to sink in so that I can come back to them later. Ellen said that uh, she's not bored, bored at all. <laughs> and that your explanations are so good that that's why they're not questions. I really agree. Oh, wow. Ellen, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Just want to make sure people are following along and aren't shy to ask any questions if they come up. Good. Good, good, good. This is good. Tempted, tempted. Mm, should I? Yeah. Okay. I don't know if that was smart. Sometimes these things hijack my brain. I want that highlight. Uh, see now? Just get that shape to work a little better. Good. Now let's turn to the ear, which is driving me crazy. But it's so, so, so gray when it actually needs to be totally chromatic. He said and kept on working on the cheek. Let's see what's going on here. Rembrandt, how do you paint ears? Let's investigate. So a lot of red, pretty chromatic. What's going on there? Some yellow. And let's put it down pretty translucently. See if we can let the monochrome do some of the work for us. And then over here, it starts with, strangely enough, it starts kind of gray on top, then goes pink. This Rembrandt's a sneaky painter. Notice what he's doing with all of these grays hanging around everywhere. It's really making those areas that are pink look so much more chromatic than they are. They aren't really that chromatic, but because they're being put next to all those grays, they really look like they pop. So here we have some, some brown. Kind of just causing this interference over here, some beautiful brown interference. That, and this little moment over here is chromatically pink as well. Doo -doo. Boom. Okay. Now let me take a look at this. What have we done? Let's examine it. Now we've, we've done some stuff. It's worth taking a look at it and thinking while grabbing a sip of water. Let's see what's going on here. So it looks to me like the chin is threateningly I chroma. So let's go back in there with a little bit more gray temperament to make those uh, make those reds relax. Needs to be a little bit more brown, less red, at least in some areas. And then it's going to be time to work on some shadows. Uh, 
one right here, man, under the nose. So formatic. We haven't gotten there yet. Let's try to get this full done, shall we? Yeah, Cam, let's do it. All right, glad you agree. Quite red, there he is. Beautifully red. Red, red, you sneaky, sneaky painter. There's so much red over here at the bottom of the nose. Pee! Gonna go high chroma there for sure. Are you seeing this on your reference? Crazy red. Starting to deal with the more shadowy areas, as you're noticing, now that the lights are kind of becoming more established. Now the shadows are calling for attention. This is still a little red. Make a gray. better. Nice, nice. Pretty happy with this. Here we need even more chroma. Okay, let me think about the best way forward. I think what we're going to do is this. We're going to hit these areas that are the lightest areas inside of the shadow, and that is going to be our path forward. So this area, kind of yellowish, right? So we're going to start mixing some darker colors. Hope you're noticing what's going on on the tablet. There's a new path, a new color is created. Ah, oh, that is perfect. Sometimes you mix and it doesn't work. Sometimes it's perfect. That's exactly what's going on there. And then next to it, there's a variation of this exact color with a reddish, reddish tint. That's not perfect. It's to be a little bit lighter. That's what we need. These areas of the shadow, the chroma is higher, so we want to make sure that we hit that. Even here, there's like red moments right there. Really interesting. Now let's see what happens here. This eye, hello. Where have you been all my life? Let's see what we're going to do. So all the shadow areas here, if you zoom in on your reference, you're going to see a lot of red, really a lot of red in there. But I don't want to put it in with a lot of texture, so I'm putting some medium in here to make sure that these reds, you know, they're as red as they need to be, but they're not sticking out texture-wise, just to let me think about whether or not I'm ready to commit. Now there's that area, the right side of the eye is pretty gray. So I'm going to rely on the fact that my brush is still saturated with other colors to know that it's not going to become a perfect gray even if I try. So that doesn't worry me. Then we have pink going on there for the rest of the eyelid. Honestly, this brush is too big for what I'm trying to do, but pushing the limits. 
Cannon, stop pushing the runner. See a runner moving the thing. Say, no, people, let's be brave. Come on. Right, and then we have here at the edge of the eye, it goes more neutral, more gray, even a little bit greenish. And you're noticing I have no shame in talking about green or blue, even though they're not on my palette, because I'm just using the next best thing, you know? So if it's green, that means black and yellow. That makes a pretty good green. Not a problem. If it's blue, just a perfect gray is gonna look blue. Not a problem as well. You always wanna be working with what you got and not like imagining it's like, oh, if I only had, you know, you don't. So let's just work with what we got. Then here, much higher chroma. This thing going on like that, kind of coming inwards, and then above them, kind of goes yellow, right? Right. Right. So I'm sneaking in on that eye. I'm not immediately just going like pupil, boom. I'm like trying to see if I can sort out what's going on around it so that when I arrive to work on the eye, I'm like, everything's ready, you know? Never want to rush into working on something like an eye and putting it in the wrong place. That's a nightmare. Putting this in quite delicately, making them more chromatic as they need to be. Very delicate light wash, some medium in there. And then here at the edge of the eyebrow, we have some of that dark gray coming in. I'm gonna pull some green into this because I don't see that green on my reference, but I know this painting pretty well in person. And I remember, I remember what's there. Any questions, people? You gonna let me ramble, ramble, ramble through this? Wow, wow, wow. Well, no questions, then I'm going to ramble. Just working with the, trying to also imitate the way Rembrandt applied paint. I'm looking at the directions of his strokes because that's an important part of creating his effects. So that's definitely on my, on my mind as I'm making these moves. Some light gray over here, the edge of this lid. Boom. That is fun. Now let's see what happens on the bottom of the eye. We have some gray coming into the red. Pulling it. So darker gray coming down the bottom. What's going on at the corner of the eye? God help us, as it is so strange. But we'll try. Ellen has a question. Yeah, Ellen. Um, it's about the gray mark on his chin. Mm. Will you leave it with these sharp edges, or will you soften later? Uh, do you mean this? Because if you do, or do you mean this? I, I am not beholden yet to any of the edges that I put down. So anything that you see as too sharp, as soon as my eye gets upset by it, I'm gonna soften it. Like for example, if I take a look at what you're pointing out, I do suspect that you're talking about this and I can definitely soften it. And plan to. 
of the, <laughs> the letter. But also it's gonna become more clear once I have this shadow color. So I can pull that shadow onto the form. It's gonna make a little more sense. Uh, no, she means about the spot under the lip and red spot. Oh, here? Yeah, I definitely didn't really get into that yet, but I will take care of all of it. There's so much to do over here. Rembrandt definitely didn't make our life easy. Let's see, can we get at the eye? Now, let's leave it for later. Mm, let's, put a, let's put a little bit of effort into it. Let me see which brush. I'm gonna take this brush and some medium. Let's go straight black, but with medium, so it's kind of transparent. Let's see if I can sketch out that shape. Man, am I happy that the phone's not closer to the painting because now that it's in front of my face, I'm feeling the hardship. I feel like this brush is too small. Let's try another one. This guy. Much better. That's, that's fun. That is fun. Now let's take another brush similar to that one to get everything that's going on. Well, I don't know about everything, but some of what's going on inside of the eye. There's like a greeny, greeny color underneath right here. Which didn't really make any difference when I put it, so I'm going to have to do a better job. Take two. Oh, this brush is not going to be, huh? Let's see. Much better. Now the inside of the eye is a grayish color with red edges. Let's try to get that in there. Oh, move just a bit. Right. I think I could use my previous brush for this. There we go. And on the edge of the eye, we have something that's closer to a neutral gray. And then let's see if we could get that highlight in there. There's two of them. There's one that goes on top of here. And then another one kind of there. Didn't work. All right. For now, that will be sufficient. Of course, once it's dry, I could do more. But let me see if I could get these shadows to also make an appearance, these reddish shadows over here. Whoo! Feel the suspense, people. 
Um, there's another question. Yep. Is that tape on your brush and why? It's tape on my brush because sometimes uh, I'm working with very similar brushes for very different purposes and I don't want to get them confused. So for example, I would put white tape on a brush that I plan on using for highlights and then black paint on a brush that I plan on using for dark accents. And then hopefully it helps me not get those two confused. But right now the paint is totally insignificant. I just didn't take it off from the last time that I put it on. Sometimes I also put yellow tape to differentiate the brushes that my students bring from my brushes when they have similar brands and everything that's marked yellow is, is mine. If they're using it and then they don't take it from me. That's a wonderfully non-inspiring <laughs> non answer, very technical and senna, but that's how it is. Okay, that eye is working for now. Of course, it's going to need to be further improved once it's dry, but for now I'm okay with it. Keep on being greedy, there's more, there's more. Woo, too light, too light, too light, emergency. There we go. Whew, I barely could breathe when I was doing that. It's very small. In my defense, Rembrandt painted it much bigger, so he didn't have to work super tiny on these details. All right, let's see what I can do about these shadows. If I could get some washes to improve our mood, shall we? Before I do that, let me just try. Not too bad, not too bad. All right, let's grab this previous brush and go for something that's gonna make the shadows happier. So, let's grab this brown here. It's a pretty good starting point. He said, as he judged himself to be wrong, it's too, um, too red. We need to green it up a bit. Much better. And the shadows, you know, I'm trying to keep them simple. So I'm starting with an overall wash on everything. Later, I'm gonna come in and make things a little more specific. But for now, let me just cover up all this charcoal, get some quiet in here. No, next to the nose, this color is not going to work. It needs to be a little more red. That's okay. I'm using this color only when I think it would serve me, but in some areas I'm hesitating when it's too different from what's actually going on there. Now it's going to be much more fun to work on all these edges because I have something to work against. Before, I had nothing in the shadow. Now I can soften this up, play around, get the blend, be a happy camper. Mm. 
Now this shadow cast by the nose is more red, and a little darker. So I responded by mixing something a little different on the palette. And then over here, it stops being that color. It goes lighter again. Kind of amazing how reddish orangish these shadows are. It's the result of having blue light in the studio. Blue daylight will give you nice orangey shadows. That's because the color of the light source produces a complementary color in the shadow. So if my light source is the blue light coming from the sky, then the complementary color of blue is orange. And we're going to see that very dominant in the shadows. Super cool, right? Using the same uh, brush? Yep, same brush. I only changed to a smaller brush for uh, working on the eyes because it, the, the eye because it was absolutely tiny. But now that I'm back to working more broadly, I just switched back to the same brush, cleaned it with solvent, and it's back in business. Usually I don't use the same brush for the shadows and for the lights, but in this case, I feel that it's you know, the colors are so similar that this little drop in value, you know, usually if I need to, for example, if I wanted to work on the hat, I would 100% change brush because even a tiny bit of white would spoil that dark, deep black that's required in the hat. But when I'm working on these shadows, you know, they are dark, but they're not close to being like pitch black or anything like that. So having a tad bit of contamination from the previous colors doesn't really worry me so much. And whenever it does, I just do what I'm doing now. Just dip into solvent, wipe on my rag. So this area to be a little darker. Here I'm purposefully going to let it mix with the lights. Definitely don't want to get my mustache to be a sharp edge. That would be quite the mistake. And thanks again for joining me. As I'm doing this, it's very fun to be able to paint this with you. I appreciate your support on Patreon, and I hope you like the videos. All right. Now, this beard came out a little too dark. No worries. We're just going to take some lighter variation of the gray and dab to improve the situation. And from the bottom, again, there's that super high chroma red moment, which is a stretch for this size brush that I'm working with. I might need to take the smaller one for it, but I'm just going to give it a shot. There's a question if you are 
if the wash that you are cleaning up to the brush is with medium or salt? So we have a, a, a wash that you're washing the brush with, you're cleaning the brush, you always clean the brush with solvent. You don't clean the brush with a medium. Now what's happening when I'm doing a wash on my painting is that uh, that happens with medium right now in this layer, but in the previous layer, it was happening with solvent because you constantly want to be um, increasing the level of oiliness as the layers uh, progress. And there's a chemical reason for that, which is gonna to take too long to get into now, but just remember this rule of thumb, you wanna paint later layers fatter than early layers. And medium makes your paint fatter. Solvent makes your paint leaner. I'm gonna actually go into it a little bit once I, once I uh, feel comfortable with these shadows. I'll explain this rule a little bit in a few minutes. Okay. This area remains, it's pretty yellowy. I'm actually gonna grab some more yellow for the sake of that spot. Maybe a little bit of white too, it's kind of lighter than the rest. What's going on there in the chat? Um, he says asking, what are the best oil paints? In terms of brand? Um, she might have it. Yeah, let me know if you're talking about brands, you're talking about pigments, what are we talking about? Yes, so I think Old Holland. Brands. Old Holland. If you can afford them, by all means get them. They're the best. I cannot afford them. So you can get them for me too. And what are the ones that you use? Ah, so I use a combination. I, uh, I actually like test different pigments from different brands to see what I like. Like for example, some brands are better from gambling. Some brands are better, uh, brands, some pigments are better from Williamsburg. So I actually, for example, my cadmiums, I prefer either Williamsburg or Michael Harding. But for my earth colors, I don't like these companies. For my earth colors, I prefer to use either gambling or Utrecht. So for my, or, or for example, for my manganese violet, I only go Michael Harding. So it, it just depends because different brands make the pigments differently. So sometimes, for example, like I was raving about Old Holland before because overall they're the best, but their burnt sienna is pitiful. It's horrible. It looks completely purple. It's just the worst burnt sienna that you can imagine. So even the best brand can make some pigments very poorly, uh, which requires some uh, personal research on your end to determine how you like your pigments. Some people like their burnt sienna leaning more towards violet, purplish burnt sienna. I hate that. I want my burnt sienna to lean orange, very strictly lean orange. And uh, that has to do with personal preference. So it's worth trying it out. But definitely like as a solid affordable baseline, I'd say gambling is safe overall. How is that for a complicated answer? Uh, Helen asking, why don't you like Michael Harding Earth Colors? They are too stiff. They, they, I like my Earth Colors softer when they come out of the tube. Uh, I don't like, like for example, I don't mind if my cadmium is stiff because cadmium, I just need a bit of it, right? I just dip my brush into a pixel of cadmium and everything becomes red. But earth colors, I need to carry them at a much greater amount. So if they're not like nice and creamy and they're stiff, I can't even carry them with a brush. They, they're, they're too like sticky. And that annoys me with pigments that I need to use in, in large quantities, right? So you never need to use cadmium in large quantity because it's very, very aggressive. But when you need like a nice hefty stock of yellow ochre, it's super annoying. That answer the question? Cool. Yes. Thank you. Perfect.
Perfect. Okay, let's get to that shadow on the nose that was freaking me out for so long. What's going on here, Rembrandt? What are you doing to me? Dark red. Okay, I'm to clean this up because you noticed I was dipping the brush in that dark color and white was coming out. So that's, that's not gonna help me now. Let's see what we can do here. Long stroke, Let's start it off. That's actually working better than I expected. And the bottom of the nose actually has some reflection, so I feel like some white in there won't hurt me too much. Gonna help me with the blend. And I'm always worried about nostrils because they're super duper duper dark. And if they're in the wrong shape or the wrong size, everything kind of becomes lame and cartoonish. So first I'm going to be dealing with this edge. Notice if you can zoom in on your reference, the edge with the, with the reddish shadow of the nose is suddenly gray in a crazy beautiful way. What was that? Oh no, don't text me now. Let me close this thing. Do you see this gray? People. I want responses to this gray. How crazy is it? Ah, one second. Sorry about that. Close this. How can I close it? They say yes. What is it? I don't know. My messages are closed, but they're still appearing. Sorry, people. Technology is like overwhelming me right now. And I don't want my messages as much as you don't want them. But I don't know how to close them. See the gray, right? I get responses to the gray. It's such a beautiful transition. Yes, Daniel also said yes. From like... It starts pink, goes gray, and goes red again. That's yeah, mastery of color, you know. Unbelievable stuff, really gorgeous. Because it would have been so easy to go from pink to dark red, you know, but no, there is a transition of, of gray in between them. It's just, ah, oh, come on, Rembrandt. Can you be better? Too good. Like a little pause between the drums, like two, <gasps> like it's the hi-hat, you know? that gray in between the pumps, no, not the pumps, how do you say it in English, the beats. All right. Ah, oh, get me too excited over the gray transitions. What are you doing to me, Rembrandt? Boom. Now, are we ready for me attempting the nostril? Oh boy. BSA, um, it's like he's painting the inside edges of the nose outside. The inside edges of the nose outside. I can't say I understand what you mean. Inside edges of the nose outside. Got, got it? Sounds like I should understand it, but maybe you want to explain? I don't understand that either. Are you asking me why it's becoming gray that way? Because I would have to admit that I don't know. Sometimes that area goes super red. Sometimes that area goes super gray. You just have to observe. Observe closely and not fall into templates. So that was so fun to paint that bottom of the nose. It kind of got a little too large, so I'm gonna push back against it. Okay. Brilliant.
to make it a little darker here. Yes, I, sorry, my English is bad. Don't worry, my English is bad too. No. <laughs> uh, the blackness of the inside of the nose mm -hmm. will turn gray at the edges. Uh, no, that is not correct. The, the black of the inside of the nose will turn red at the edges. That I know for a fact. That's because of an optical effect called subsurface scattering, where at the edge of the nose, where the skin is pretty translucent, light penetrates it and makes the chroma rise. So that area right here is almost always right at the edge of the, of the nostril, surprisingly high chroma, red, like I'm adding now. So either I didn't understand or we have a disagreement on that specific point. Uh, Elena, do you ever paint flowers? I painted flowers at least once, and that was fun, but it's not totally my thing. I guess if somebody ordered a flower painting from me, I'd be happy to do it. But it's, uh, it's challenging on two levels. It's challenging because it's so difficult to be creative when something that's in front of you is so beautiful already. You know, it's, uh, for example, when you're painting a portrait of, the, of an old man, making it beautiful is, is nothing to take for granted. You have to be very creative about it. But when you're confronted with something that's basically raw beauty, like flowers, uh, it's kind of, you know, it's not the best thing for my creativity. It's kind of like painting a sunset. Hard to get away with it and not make it kitschy. But I'm open to trying. Also, the second thing that's difficult about them is that they move so quick. You know, if you don't get that sketch done in a few hours, they start to die on you. Do you paint a lot of flowers? Is that why? Whomever asked? Ellen. Ellen. Ellen, is flowers your thing? Where's Patrick? Is Patrick around? Is Patrick with us? Patrick, I'm sorry that I didn't leave the background. I remember. Oh, Patrick's not here. Where's Patrick? Okay, where's Patrick? Patrick, I hope you're watching the rerun. <laughs> we miss you. And Ellen sa says that um, I do like painting flowers. Yes. So yes. Well, the one flower painting I did paint is on my dad's wall. He loves it. So flowers do tend to make people happy, and that's definitely a plus. Ooh, this is fun. It's fun when it's working. Get that neck done. So the neck is like, there's orange on the edges, which I might actually need to add some white to. And then in the middle, very neutral greenish gray. Gorgeous. Just gorgeous stuff. Lisa asks, do you like Windsor and Newton oil paints? Yes, they're pretty decent. They're not my favorite, but I definitely would use them. Uh, you have to differentiate between Windsor and Newton and Winton. Winton is trash. It's the, it's the same company making color cheaply or making color properly. So when they make color cheaply, boy, do they make it cheaply. It's just horrendous. Uh, but if you're buying the artist grade, they work perfectly fine. I, I have skepticism with that company 
because some of their stuff's a little inconsistent. Like I would use something for one, one year, then I would buy another tube and then it behaves differently. Like, I don't know, they're fussing with stuff in a way that's making me a little, a little suspicious, so. But that's just my suspicious nature. I always think these companies are conspiring to not give me the paint I want. Now this hint of the ear. Ding. Ooh, this is fun. So do you see how by mixing a very small amount of pigments, probably no more than 20 on my palette, spending some time in advance to mix those colors really allows me a lot of freedom as I'm working through this painting because I already have so much artillery at my disposal that things are flowing really nicely. Can I get into this eye? What do you guys say? Can I do it? It's kind of necessary now because it's sticking out, but it's frighteningly difficult. So cross fingers for me. I'm gonna try to use this small brush again, which was annoying last time. Let's see what. I'm gonna drink some water before. And remind me, friends, I'm liable to forget. It's gonna happen. I'm gonna finish this eye, and then I'm gonna feel like I, I finished the face. You have to remind me on chat to finish this spot. See the spot of the neck, the light on the neck? Don't let me forget, I'm gonna get upset and sad. You'll remind me, right? Ha, <laughs> you're the best. Elena, how do you decide what to leave for the next layer or what to finish now? Ah, oh, such a hard question. Um, I am prioritizing bringing my painting to a situation where it feels wholesome, you know, when it feels like it's together. For example, I couldn't have really left the eye, this eye undone, because it would be like a hole that I'm leaving in my, in my painting, which is, it's a very unhealthy thing. So I just kind of think about, like for example, it's easy to stop at the shirt. Right, because the shirt and the face, they're kind of like a different material. If I paint the shirt next time and my colors are a little different, that's very easy to deal with. But if I wanna come back into the face and mix a different set of colors and all the colors I'm mixing are gonna be slightly different and it's never gonna come together, big bummer. So I wanna at least get a pass on the entire face, even if it's very, very basic. That's why I'm prioritizing you know, the, the bigger color relationships as opposed to getting every micro detail done because I just want to leave the painting at a place that's going to be um, hospitable to me next time. Does that make sense? That, that was a strange answer. Tell me if it makes sense. No great concept. Perfect. Yeah, I just don't want to leave holes, you know? Don't want to leave holes. Oh, there's orange in here. Ding, ding, ding. Rembrandt, what a master. It's gonna be so fun when it dries, you guys. Oh man, that's gonna be great. Nothing's gonna move on me. I can get even smaller details in there with even smaller brushes that I don't own. And squeaking of the chair. 
thanks again to Daniela, our lovely moderator, for helping me with this. Really appreciate it. Reading the questions out beautifully. With all this lemon water. No, perfectly. Just flawlessly. Trying to get the chroma of, of, of uh, what's going on under the under the pupil, but because there's so much black in there, it's just super difficult. So that's an, that's something that is going to be so easy next layer. Even though I feel like I just literally got it. Needs to have some brown around it. I'm being greedy. Yeah. So here the chroma is going to going to hell very quick. Quack, quick. Uh, I have an accent too, forgive me. Uh, but once this is all dry, it's gonna be way, way easier to deal with this. I can't wait for the net to be open so I can take this painting to the original and <laughs> check the colors because as good as the scan that the net provided us is, and it's a pretty decent scan, it'd be really great to be able to look at the live painting and really judge all these color decisions to make sure that I'm hitting the right notes. All, if some of my patrons are New York based, maybe we'll do a hangout where we meet at the Met together and check my colors <laughs> and see how wrong I am. How does that sound? Kate is asking, are you going to put in the large orange red highlight from the right side down to his chest? This? Ah! No! I dropped my brush. Pardon the interruption. Wow, I really dropped it. Let it go. It flew away. That was. I found it. Tell me which highlight you're referring to. I'd be interested in knowing. The large orange large. red highlight on the right side down right to side. his chest. This? That's the shirt. You mean the shirt? Oh, we have delay. Do we have delay? No. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to paint the shirt. No. It would be much better done next time. Saying that it's not the sheriff, it's the oh. bare chest. The bare chest, so it's this, right? That part. That I will surely do. And thanks for reminding me, because if I didn't do that, oh, that would be really annoying to try to add next time, because this will be dry, and I won't be able to. Oh, here's a great way to answer this question. Ah, oh, thank you for bringing this to my attention. So what would happen, let me pause and, and imagine a scenario where I didn't do this. Right, and I come in next time and I'm, I'm trying to blend these two things together and make this edge soft. Impossible, right? Because this would be dry, this would be dry. I would put this here, I would want to make a nice edge between them, and I would be a very, very frustrated painter. So, definitely very important to get this done when this is still wet. Too light, people. Why do you let me mix it this way? Don't worry. Solve it. Not too bad. Um, under the necklace is red chest. Under the necklace 
is red chest. Ah, oh, no way. <laughs> I call no way on that. It's a red shirt. But again, there's room for disagreement. I am pretty sure that's a red shirt. I've never seen a chest so red in my life. But maybe, maybe Rembrandt is, you know, unique in other ways, aside from being a master painter. And is especially gifted in the redness of chest. So you notice how the the wash I put down on the shadow kind of works for most areas. I just had to put a few hints in there, here and there, and it kind of pulls it together in a very satisfactory way. So sometimes in the shadows, it's better to play it, uh, play it simple. Just adding a few more punch lines on these eyebrows. She says uh, it goes from his check down his neck under the nameless breath. Well, yeah, no, I understand. You mean this triangle, and we have a disagreement <laughs> because I don't think that this is his chest. I am sure that it's a red shirt. Come on, we can agree to that. Right, you mean this triangle right there. That's, I see it as a red shirt. But it's okay, you can imagine that it's, that it's the chest, I can imagine that it's a shirt. No matter what it is, I don't need to do it in this session. It would be easier to do it next time. because I have the necklace separating whatever this is and whatever this is. So I don't really need a soft edge in there. Helen says, uh, I think she means the red starting on the right check, cheek. The red starting on the right cheek. Right, wow. I'm sorry, people. <laughs> I'm confused. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to adopt this proposition. You tell me if you agree. I'm going to tell you when I feel like I'm gonna be done, and then we'll know whether or not I reach that spot or not. Because I, I just don't know what, what we're talking about. Again here, what a beautiful gray edge, huh? Gorgeous gray edge. And see how easy it is for me to get this edge to be soft because now everything is still wet. Feather-like touches get this edge to be very, very, very soft. If I lift this for next time, sadness would ensue. This eye is like too visible for me. I wish I could paint it a little bit more mysterious. It's a little too late for that. I'm gonna have to bury it under some stuff next time. Don't want it to be so, so out there. But overall, I think we did a pretty good job. What do you guys think? All right. I think this would be pretty good place very soon 
to stop this layer and let it dry. And next time, something super excited that I'm really waiting for is the hair. Oh, those beautiful curls. Next time we'll do this and hopefully we'll also finish the outfit in the background. We might finish the whole first pass next time. So that's going to be exciting. Uh, let me know. Does anybody have any last questions that they want to get in? We're coming up on... Oh, we are. We've been here for two hours. You people are awesome for staying with me this long. I really hope you enjoyed it. Do you understand? So tell me. I just... Come point. Point to it. Where is it? Show me. <laughs> no, okay. point... We are really trying to get that. Uh, it's difficult when we can see the same, but I mean, we are seeing way, 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 way down to the left. Left. So what I think she's talking about. Yeah, is talk to me. If we, can I, can I just? Yeah, just show me there. Is this? Oh, you mean the highlight? Let's see this. Do you mean you this? From the cheek uh -huh. all the way under okay, the neck. Okay, so like, wow. terminology, terminology, people. This is not a highlight. <laughs> this is a reflected no, she light. Didn't see oh. Highlight. I see. Uh, yeah, the lash oil, mm -hmm. the red highlight. Okay, so this is not a highlight. A highlight is this. When a light is coming in at the edge of the shadow, it means it's being reflected off of something. For example, it could be reflected off of this orange shirt. Light is coming in this way and bouncing back towards the cheek. So this would be a reflected light. And now that we have agreed on the area, I'm gonna do it. I think, is that area case? I'm gonna do it just because we've talked about it and now it's a whole thing, I'm gonna put it in. Let me put it in. It's that, right? I don't, I don't, she didn't say yes, <laughs> yes. No response. Okay, we're gonna put it in. I hope it is. Yes, it's that one. Great, we, we find it. I'm gonna put it in. Especially for you, persistent <laughs> people that explain That's to me. Great. So now we learned what a reflected light is and we're gonna put it in. Would have worked well next time too, but Put a bit of it now. Very important when you're making these moves is not making it too light. These reflected lights are not super high value. They're quite dark. And what's gonna make it pop is if I get this area to be a little darker. So I'm gonna go there. Thank you for persisting and explaining. And Daniela, you clarified the whole thing. Because as soon as I hear highlight, I don't even think that it's inside of the shadow. Highlights are only parts of the light. And that would require me to move this shadow a little bit more. Let me do that. Does this uh, satisfy the people who were waiting for this reflection? Hope so. No answer. <laughs> All right, yeah. Well, it satisfies me. I'm pretty happy with where it is. So, as I was saying, next time my plan is to get the hair, and also get the outfit. So that's gonna be super fun. And just kind of, as I was pointing to that, I ruined the nose. Let's fix it. Fix. You have to remember to show it closer. Oh, right, show close up. Thank you, Daniela, for reminding me as I'm ruining the nose. <laughs> I think it's this area of the nose that needs treatment, right? The 
top needs to come in just a little bit more. Yeah, what's going on here? When you're painting portraits, every little micro movement can cause disruptions. <laughs> Hmm, hard to finish no. session when you're thinking, you know, that there's, there's not just an emotional thing because next time it's all going to be dry. So now I have this opportunity to work on it while it's wet and we're not going to have this opportunity ever anymore. So we're going a little low over two hours. Sorry, Daniela. I know, <laughs> I know there's other stuff on the agenda. But thank you for Link for hanging out with us and with Rembrandt this Sunday afternoon. Yeah, I feel like that's a pretty good place. I've said this before. Sweetie, that's making a sound. Yes. All right, I'm happy with it. Thank you for watching. I really appreciate it. And if you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to like and subscribe. Please consider supporting me on Patreon at patreon.com slash Ken Goshen. For lessons, please visit my website at kengoshen.com slash lessons. See you next time.